as this goes on, the armies are forced, the American armies are forced back into the Hurtgen and the Ruhr River. And they say, okay, you know, we were here six weeks ago, the Bulge pushed us out, now we've got to take that same ground back. But now we have learned a few lessons. Instead of going into the hurt gun, we're going to go on top. We're going to take those dams and go on the top of, of the ridge. But there's still the Siegfried line and the famous dragon's teeth. And here's where it was feast or famine. The first guys that get there said we're crawling <coughs> through the snow and all of a sudden machine guns popped up from every place imaginable. Our captain gets shot in the head, and we crawled back. And we learned the Germans weren't going to, to give up. So we brought in 155-millimeter uh, self-propelled guns. And the guys would fire at a machine gun emplacement or a concrete pillbox, and then the GIs would rush and take it. And they go, a lot of times the Germans weren't killed inside, even with a 155 millimeter cannon, but they were dazed and confused. And as we would capture a concrete pillbox, Patton writes about them extensively in his diaries. He's like, my God, they're huge. They're, they can hold 30 to 35 people. There are three stories, one above, two below ground. In the back is an office or a suite for the officers. They've got hot and cold running water. They've got electricity off of diesel generators. They've got hospitals. They've got, you know, kitchens. You know, the guys were fine in here. He couldn't believe the amount of concrete that they poured into it. Crazy thing, the only way to get in was like a, a back door that had a small little lock. And we would put TNT on it, blow it up, and rush in. Well, the Germans very quickly adapt. As we were spending the night in a pillbox out of the cold and the snow, they would call their own artillery down on their own defensive position. They knew exactly where it was, or the guys would sleep. Whoa, all right. Aliens are coming. All right. Or they would fall asleep, and they would wake up and be surrounded by Germans the next day. So they go, this is ridiculous. Pounding through the same area twice is even more difficult than it was the first time. Or, if they're not fighting their way through the Siegfried line, they would find out that the Germans, some of them would just mass surrender. The Germans were bringing up either old men who were just waiting for Americans to show up and saying, oh, we're good, or young SS, very small, like 14, 15, 16, teenage Hitler youth guys who thought they could win the war by themselves. So you either had these hardcore fanatics or these old guys who are like, man, we're done, we are out of here. If we're going to get captured by somebody, it's going to be you. We don't want to be captured by the Soviets. And then the army begins to move into um, different towns. And they learn from fighting in places like Aachen. They remembered the tactics that they used street fighting way back in the Norman towns immediately after D-Day. A couple grenades in the window, when they explode, you go in shooting. And the bazookas or the tanks would blow holes through the row houses, and they said, in street fighting, A, you don't go on the street, and B, you never stop running. You go through the town, and you cut off the enemy's retreat. Well, they were blowing the snot out of German towns on the floodplain between Belgium and the Rhine River. So much so that various Burgermeisters were coming up, mayors saying, hey, to the SS, surrender, or, or take your fight to a different village, but, but get out of here. So as we got deeper into February, it was not uncommon to find Burgermeisters being hanged from lampposts or shot by the SS. While Hitler was alive, right, the Nazi party was still feared. You could not just give up. These are the Germans doing this to their own people. And so as February moves into March, there is a big race to get to the Rhine River. There is a lot of 
of prestige and pride <laughs> built into the one who gets the Rhine is the border, the big border of Germany, this big thing up the Mississippi River German style. And here's where if you talk to uh, some of the soldiers at that time when they got into Germany and they got in, into a town, they would just go in and you know they would go to a house and say, okay, you've got five minutes, get the hell out. Didn't matter if it was old people, didn't matter if it was a mom and little children. They said, we just didn't care. And they weren't destructive. They didn't break stuff. Looting was fair game, but they didn't destroy. Where a lot of people would have vandalized everything, the GIs knew they were going to be there for a night. And they go, just to have a, a down bed, just to have hot and cold running water was unimaginable. So if a German family had to sleep in the street for a night, when I just lived in a hole in the ground at negative 35, I just simply don't care. I mean, you know, if they don't like it, deal with it. Um, and so if you look at, you know, every, there's, there's criminals, there's sad sacks, there's jerks in every army. But if you look at the military police statistics coming into an, I mean, I'd be mad as hell. I mean, look. If I could sleep in a hole in the ground and you've been living like this for the last four years and you brought me over here, it's on. Um, there were some criminal acts, there were some rapes and, and, and some murders, but on the American side, it's the smallest of any army in World War II. Guys were like, look, we just want to be warm. And what the GI begins to write in, in their diaries, Kurt Vonnegut included, will say, we couldn't believe it, and Pat and Bradley say this too. Going through France, the stuff was destroyed, people just left it there. It's like, we're going through towns, and as we're leaving the east end, there are old men and women on the west end already going through the rubble, putting shingles and roofs back on their houses. Things were cleaned up and organized while the fight was still going on. One of the things that GIs said that they would love to do when they got to a really nice area, they knew the officers would pick the nicest house in town. So and this is kind of gross, I apologize everyone. They would all go to that house, if it had, especially if it, if it had indoor plumbing, they would all go to the bathroom and the toilet and not flush it, and then run to the smaller houses and wait for the CO to come and have a clogged, a clogged toilet. So orders were going out, no going to, to the bathroom in the CO's houses before we get there, which if you're a frontline soldier, only encourage them to do it even more. Like, what are you going to do? All right, like, arrest me. Okay, I go to plant care. So, um... That is February, while the big three are hanging out in the Crimean Peninsula. So Montgomery is taking his the Dragoon Guards and the good old Guards Armored Division to the towns of Wiesel and Dortmund. And the main goal now is to get across the Rhine, but to get to the industrial heartland of Germany. The, the Buffalo, the Cleveland, the Pittsburgh, the Detroit, Youngstown, Chicago uh, of Germany right along the Ruhr River. In the center, headed for the big city of Cologne, are um, General, General Bradley's two ace in the holes, William Simpson and Courtney Hodges. And Simpson is known for a couple things. He's the one guy that got along equally well with Montgomery and Patton. Their egos and their, their sense of bring, being prima donnas didn't bother him. He was able to work with either guy, and he liked to joke with Patton, God, you know, George, Ike and Bradley are much younger than us, and he's still got to carry the ball for those two um, sons of guns. We're doing all the hard labor, and they're taking all the um, credit for it. By this time, Patton is in the South, and he's got an independent command headed toward the city of Bonn and a little bridgehead town known as Ramaga. And Patton's going to have great glory, and then he's going to do something a little stupid shortly after that, as only Patton can, can do. And the Remagen Bridge is, is famous as the Allied armies closed to the Rhine. Bridge after bridge after bridge had been destroyed by an aerial bombing or by the Germans retreating. Then on March 7th, 
Young second lieutenant Emmett Burroughs is creeping along with the Jeep all by himself and he comes to this ridge early in the afternoon about one o'clock and he looks over and below him is an old World War I railroad bridge named for Eric Ludendorff, the famous World War I German general. And it looks intact and he's staring at it and as he looks across he can see Germans running around and he sees them looking at him with binoculars so they know that he's there. So he calls his boss, First Lieutenant Carl Timmerman and says, hey Carl, you're not going to believe this, but I got a bridge. Where are you at? I don't know, the map's in a place called Remagen. Are you sure it's intact? Well, yeah. There are Germans over there. I see them. They're, they're, they're looking at me. It looks like they're in a, in a big argument. And what he says proves to be true. Before this, as the army was advancing eastward, they were developing new tactics. After Market Garden, the armies trained how to use rubber boats. And assault forces would take these rubber like zodiacs and paddle them across the rivers. Um, the swamps, the, the thousands of tributaries and little creeks and streams around the area. But it's the winter and the snow was melting, or late winter, early spring, and so the currents were running very fast. The rivers are three to four hundred yards wide, and these were obstacles the GIs had to overcome normally at night. And we began developing big smoke generators to blow smoke out. And as we would cross each little tributary, the Germans were laying in wait with machine guns. And as we carried the Zodiacs out of the woods under no cover, soldiers were getting shot constantly. And the Germans began taking an old friend of theirs called a shoe mine, and they were encasing it in wood, putting it on a wooden trigger so mine detectors couldn't find it. And when you would step on it, it would pop out of the ground. And it wasn't so much designed to kill, but it would maim. It would blow your ankle or your leg off below the knee or wound you in the groin in the lower stomach. So it would hurt really bad. You got metal shrapnel, you've got wooden splinters. So GIs were tired of trying to cross each stream in each river this way. A bridge is going to help because with it, you can bring tanks and you don't have to build a pontoon bridge. The Germans are in Remagen and they were literally deciding on what to do. And here is the Remagen Bridge and this is Timmerman and his uh, recon patrol looking from heights. It's not real big, it's about you know a quarter of a mile, but it was the only intact bridge anywhere. On the maps, it was labeled destroyed. So the Germans are over there trying to figure out what to do, and there's three guys arguing over how to handle the bridge. Well, Timmerman calls back, and he is intercepted by Patton, who says, you get as many men as you can across that bridge right now. I'm on the way. You go, 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 soldier. To Patton, he started the farthest away from the Rhine, his old antagonist Montgomery was the closest, and George said, if there's a way, I don't care what it takes, I'm crossing that bridge first. On the German side, we have Karl Friesenhahn, and he's the engineer, and he's saying, blow it, blow it, blow it. He's arguing with a couple other guys, Major Hans Schuler and Captain Willy Bratag, and they're saying no. We need to have written orders. Walter Bodel, Gerd von Rundstadt, we can't just blow a German bridge. The Fuhrer will have our heads. And <clears throat> Friesenhahn says, well, he'll really have our heads if the freaking Americans cross the bridge. I'm going to go blow it up. And he turns the key, and nothing happens. The electric detonation doesn't go off. So he has to send someone out to blow it by hand. The other two want confirmation in writing. So they go, you're doing this on your own accord. If anybody gets in trouble, freezing Han, it's going to be you. He's like, fine, whatever, I'll, I'll deal with it. When nothing happens, the Americans are on the way. Um, Carl Timmerman is leading men across the bridge. 
They're using covering fire and tanks from the other side, fighting literally girder to girder, throwing hand grenades as they go across the bridge. And the first guy to make it is a Philadelphia soldier, Sergeant Alexander Drabik, will make it across the Rhine River into Germany. He is the first foreign soldier to put his foot on that side of the Rhine River into Western Germany since Napoleon. It hadn't happened since the 1800s. He makes it. He's followed very shortly thereafter by, by Timmerman. And as the Germans are beaten back, Schuller is like, oh my God, he's not worrying about the problem at hand. He still wants to make sure he doesn't get in trouble for what happened at the bridge. So he leaves, he grabs a bike, and he pedals back to headquarters to report that the bridge was intact. Bratag and Frisianhan are going to surrender to the Americans. They are captured, and they are taken immediately um, back to Reims to Eisenhower's headquarters. Poor Schuler. Anybody guess what happens to him? He got shot. He gets shot. <laughs> he gets shot. So, yeah. Uh, 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 all right. So, all right. So, yeah. Here are the American soldiers crossing the Remagen Bridge, and it's kind of hard to tell. But if you see these guys, they're still wearing their big overcoats that they wore fighting in the Battle of the Bulge. Well, here's a paratrooper just in his his jump boots in his like spring jacket with snow still on the ground. The tanks are coming across the Bromagan Bridge. Unfortunately, an explosion does happen. It was delayed and the Ludendorff Bridge kind of rises and it settles. It's not completely destroyed and our engineers try and prop it up and they quickly put planks across and tanks one at a time zoom across. The bridge eventually does fall, but by then the engineers are there and a secondary pontoon bridge is built downriver when one of the greatest events of the war is about to happen. Patton arrives, as he said he would, and he told his aide to get him up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Patton sat down and he had a cup of coffee and a glass of water. And he would drink a swig of water and coffee, back and forth. He said, I drank them till I was ready to burst. And in great fanfare, about 9 o'clock in the morning, George walks out on the pontoon bridge all by himself, screaming and yelling. And he's like, men, this is what I think of Germany and the gosh darn Rhine River. And he unzipped his fly and peed in the Rhine River all by himself or in front of all the men. Kind of gross, but kind of, it's kind of funny, <laughs> you know. So there's Patton. So he pees in the, in the Rhine River and off he goes. Now, pure Patton, he doesn't tell anybody higher up the chain of command that he's across the river. He's going to do this himself, and that is because... His son-in-law was captured in the Battle of the Bulge. So Patton gets Creighton Abrams, the namesake of our modern M1 Abrams tank, and orders a rescue mission to go deep into Germany to rescue his son-in-law. There are two camps. There's an officer's camp and an enlisted man's camp. Patton says, ah, we'll get the enlisted men later. Go get my son-in-law. And as his tanks fight deep into Germany, as the Americans are closing up on the camp, his son-in-law volunteers under flag of truce to go out and tell the tankers to stop shooting and not killing the guards inside the prison camp when his son-in-law gets shot in the leg. So he is pulled back inside the camp, and the whole thing is a miserable failure. Patton tried to keep it off the books. He didn't tell anybody. He loses a lot of equipment and several hundred soldiers in an attempt to rescue his son-in-law, which doesn't work anyway. But he is across the Rhine. And so uh, 
The bridgehead is precarious, and um, the 9th Armored Division takes great pride in getting this, the engineers, they get this bridge built, lickety split, and guys are moving across it. And here comes Hitler's all-out attempt to shatter that bridge. He calls upon his brand spanking new super fighter, the Messerschmitt 262, a twin jet-powered aircraft. It will fight in the air one time. Its other military use is it was used to try and blow up the bridge. Conventional bombers tried it. German artillery tried it. Frogmen were put with explosives on their back trying to swim up the river and blow up the bridge. Even V2s were fired at the pontoon bridge over the Magen, but there was so much um, tank fire, 50 caliber shooting, anti-aircraft guns, and guys on the lookout. Nothing makes it in the pontoon bridge holds. And so Patton, being Patton on March 9th, two days after crossing, calls Bradley. He says, hey Brad, anybody find their way across the Rhine yet? Nah, George, we're trying, but Monty's getting real close. He thinks he has a really good idea. Patton says, well, Think we should tell him I crossed 36 hours ago? Come again, George? What did you say? Well, you think anybody should tell him I crossed 36 hours ago? Bull crap, George. How'd you do that? The bridge at Remagen, the Ludendorff Bridge, it's intact. He said Bradley started laughing. Bradley was kind of a stoic guy, not you know a real. Said he was cracking up, belly laughing on the phone, saying, "Hot dog, that'll really bunch him up. Do you want to tell him, or do you want me to do it, or should we let him find out by himself?" So everybody is now getting a little bit of revenge on their hated antagonist, Bernard Law, Bernard Law Montgomery. So um, Schuler. Is it is court-martialed, and he's sh shot by firing squad, and that'll be it. As a result, Gerd von Rundstock, the old German veteran who led the army through much of the war, was one of the two commanders at Normandy, is fired for the second time. Hitler, by this time, was not only mentally ill, but he had several other diseases. He was surviving on vitamin shots from his doctor, you know, or straight heroin, whichever you want to, want to call it. So he was out of his mind. And he decides to take full control, and he replaces Rundstadt, however, with one of his old buddies, Albert Kesselring, smiling Albert, who took over um, for the Red Baron after he was shot down in World War I. He's an old um, combat pilot, and he has now assumed control of, of the army. And while Patton is attacking down in the south, Eisenhower wants to take out the Ruhr Industrial River Valley. Um, that's what he wants. But even though Patton is still being kind of held in check, um, he's across the Rhine. So are a bunch of other Allied troops. When he crosses it, Bradley gets across, Montgomery gets across, and it's March of 45, and Germany's days are, are fatefully numbered. March 28th, everybody is now across the Rhine River. Four million Allied soldiers are on the east side of the Rhine River. It's an incredible amount of men. Still, Germany is scraping the absolute bottom of the barrel. They've got nothing left, and we just sent four million across the Rhine River. Poor, he's north to south along the German border. Trying to stop them is Walter Model, Mr. Monocle himself. And he had pledged eternal allegiance to Hitler. He was a fanatic Nazi believer in the cause. And looking at the map, he makes a fateful guess. Knowing that the Allies wanted to come for the Ruhr Industrial Valley, the shortest point was Courtney Hodges coming straight at him. He had an army <coughs> Excuse me, the 15th Panzer in the north. He brings them down on this route to block Courtney Hodges. They're going to run head to head. Unfortunately, he should have left them, well, for him, unfortunately, he should have left them where they were, where they could slide up and down. 
They can move vertically to meet any threat. When he brings them forward, the road they were on didn't allow them to cut across country. They would have to go back up and then down in sort of a V shape, if that makes sense. Because Hodges didn't come right at them. Hodges swings south to link up with Patton. And Patton was on the phone with Eisenhower in Bradley's headquarters. And Eisenhower said, no, 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 no. I want you all to go at once, go straight at them. And Patton says, no. <coughs> the last time we went right at them was in the Falaise Gap, and they got away. We're going to swing south, and we're going to come around behind them. We're not going to have to fight them until we're behind them. Then they are going to retreat. And Patton tells this to Bradley. He says, Brad, if I tell it to Ike, you know he's not going to listen. So you tell him. I don't know if I can do that, George. And Patton's like, when have I been wrong? Name a time since you brought me back, besides my side trip that you don't know about yet, that I've been wrong. <coughs> All right, go ahead. And Bradley was like, well, my God, <clears throat> you know, George, you're right. He's like, I know. And at this time, Patton is referring to Omar Bradley as the tent maker. Well, the tent maker is bowing down to the British again, the tent maker this. And Bradley picks up the phone, and he calls Ike. And he says, you know, Ike, down here with George, and what I think we ought to do, and Eisenhower was like, no, Montgomery thinks this would be better if we go abroad front. And Patton writes, characterist uncharacteristically, Bradley freaks out and goes, damn it, Ike! I'm down here. I know what's going on. I know what I see. You took command of my army from me back in the bulge. I know what I'm doing. Are you going to give it back? Or do I have to, have to resign? And Patton picking up in the background loud enough goes, well, if you resign, Brad, I'll go first. I'll start this procession. We'll walk the hell away from this thing. And he says it loud. His staff can hear it. They can hear it back at Eisenhower's headquarters. Who's that? Is that George? George, is that you? Yes, by God, right, it's me, Ike. Brad's got a good plan, and let us follow through with it. And Eisenhower was like, well, shoot. If I got two of my, my top two commanders mad, I might as well listen to him. And he goes, well, go ahead, but you guys had better be right. And so Patton finally gets his way. And they swing around, they go to the south, and they come out behind the German army. And this is the area we're talking about. You know, Bonn, Cologne, Dusseldorf, Essen, um, Duesenberg, right in here. This is, again, the, the Pittsburgh, the Cleveland, the, the, the Detroit, Chicago, Buffalo. This is where everything is made. Americans, instead of going straight at them in this plain where we've been fighting, the Ardennes, the Eiffel, swing out, swings out and go behind them. Modal is coming down in here, and as he does that, we swoop around, and we're behind him. And so this is the area on the map. All these are large sectors of industry, pumping out artillery shells, V2 rockets, um, everything the German army needed. The one thing they didn't have is oil and oil refi refineries, railroad hubs. All these are big time targets. And so, as they are encircled, one thing we tried back in the Falaise Gap, this time it actually works. And Hitler yells out, you will withdraw under pain of death. Nobody, nobody is going to give ground. You die where you stand. At this point, he has pretty much lost it. Modal, his loyal servant, is now saying, well, we're either going to win or we all are going to be dead. And so, several generals are, are sent to help. Closest guy is Gustav von Zeugen, and he's got the 15th Panzer Army, but seeing that Patton was around behind him, instead of going into the battle, he and his men pull back and retreat. He bails on Modal. I don't know what you're new for. I try to get down there, but oops, sorry, can't help you. Uh, close by in the village of Paderborn was an SS training facility, Hitler Youth and SS. 
They had not finished all of their training, but they are sent into the battle with 60 brand new Panther and Tiger tanks, the big, strong, super new ones. This is what's going to happen. This is the time, if you've seen the movie Fury, this is the time where that movie is loosely based on. March, April of 1945, the SS are coming and they're hell-bent for leather trying to stop the American tankers. However, there's a new weapon that comes online. The American Hellcat Tank Destroyer. It looks similar to a tank, except it doesn't have the top turret. It's open like the bed of a pickup truck. And it has a higher, more powerful, high velocity cannon. And it can travel up to 55 miles an hour. So it's the fastest tank-like vehicle in the war. Well, they are brought in, and the Germans are boxed in an area, a kill box, 75 miles long by 35 miles wide. And when the Hellcats come in and start pounding the crap out of the Tigers and the Panthers, even the SS know that they're in, in trouble. And when they look around and see Montgomery coming from one side, Courtney Hodges and Simpson the other, and Patton behind him, 317,000 first-rate German soldiers surrender in mass. It was much more than ever surrendered in, in Russia, and on top of that, 30 generals. We're going to have a third of a million people fighting in their homeland and say, well, that's it. And part of the fear was, if you've got to surrender, make sure you do it to an American. You'll wind up in a POW cage. You may get fed really well. Best case scenario, you'll be sent to like Alabama and Louisiana where you'll pick cotton and tomatoes and watermelons or something, and you can get the heck out of here. Don't surrender to the British, all right, because they'll send you back to Germany. Worst case scenario, surrender to anybody but an SS officer or a, a Soviet. 317, call it a day. Here is a Hellcat tank destroyer. It's big, it's powerful, and it's fast. And during this time, Patton began experimenting. He was taking old armor off of destroyed tanks and having it welded on top of armor plate of Sherman's. And he found out that with double the armor, they could withstand um, an impact from a Tiger. He also begins to mount flamethrowers through the old machine gun port. So he's still adding weaponry to the American tanks as we move into um, Germany. Here are some of the Tigers at, at Paderborn. This is the SS training camp. The British will use it as an occupational zone barracks after the war. Now, I don't know. Um, I'm going to tell you two stories like this tonight. It was an SS barracks. I don't know that I would stay there. You could, like, burn the sheets and bring new ones in, but it's still got, like, SS cooties on it. Like, I would not feel comfortable um, uh, uh, staying in there. So but the British are going to take it over after the war and hang out for a while. Modal, realizing his men have surrendered, he was very, very critical of Field Marshal Friedrich von Paulus in Stalingrad. Paulus is the only German field marshal to ever be taken prisoner. Hitler elevated him to the rank of field marshal, knowing that field marshals don't get taken prisoner, they kill themselves. Paulus did not. Spent eight years in the gulag, came back to Germany, and was vilified for being captured and taken a prisoner. And he goes, well, look at all the men I brought back with me. If I would have been killed the Soviets would have killed all of my German soldiers. I stayed alive for them, and that somewhat pacified the German population as they thought he was a sellout or a traitor. Modal will drive into a forest outside of Dusseldorf. He had a German suicide weapon, a one-shot high-caliber pistol. He leans back against a tree and shoots himself in the head, and Walter Modal is gone. It's at this point 
that there are fewer GIs than there are German soldiers. And this is the point where a young man, Harvard-educated English student, who will wind up writing for the Saturday Evening Post and the New York Times, um, Ken Webster, said he was just in awe as the American Army is driving down the Autobahn. Because this is better than any turnpike I've seen in America. The Eisenhower interstate system wasn't there yet. And he goes, it was amazing the good order the Germans retreated in. They were all in rank and file, marching in step as if they were going on a parade. They weren't dragging, they weren't whining, there was no fighting, there was no sloppiness. Buttons were buttoned, you know, shoots were polished, and they were marching, following their officers to the rear. And he went and interviewed some of them. And he goes, we're in awe of the way you guys are marching. And they said, we are in awe of you. The Fuhrer told us that a lot of the things we hear about America aren't true, where everyone has a car and you've got this amazing industrial capacity. And he's like, all we see is tank and truck and jeep and tank and truck and jeep. You've got more than we have and we're in our own country. And so the retreating Germans heavily outnumber their POW or their, their captors in POW cages Three or four guys would stand there and guard several thousand. If they wanted to break out, they easily could have, but they didn't. So that is beginning to signal to everybody that the war is hopefully over. And to make sure there's the continued bombing of, of Germany, and you've got the Royal Air Force, and then you've got the United States Army Air Force under Karl um, Spatz. And what he did... He is the first to say what we have to do. Um, the British began bombing, and they said to bomb during the day was suicide. But to bomb at night, you don't know what you're going to actually hit. So the Americans bombed during the day, and the British bombed at night. And it was pretty much a carpet bombing. If I want to bomb the center of the room, I'll start dropping my bombs here, and I'll stop when I get to the back of the room, even with the Norton bomb site. And so people were saying Germany was being unnecessarily destroyed because the bombardiers were terrified of the flat guns and the remaining Luftwaffe is pulled back over Germany. And so Spot says we need to get fighter escorts. And so he outfits um, P-51 Mustangs with disposable gas tanks, external fuel tanks, that as you get into Germany, drop those you'll have enough gas to escort the bombers back in, into Germany and then back into Allied airspace. And this really begins an uptick on the bombing. What we were mainly after were the oil refineries. And I meant to bring in my grandfather's bombing map of his 35 missions. I forgot it. I'm not, I do apologize. But it's the big cities of this industrial corridor that we were aiming for. And the city of Cologne, one of the big industrial centers, was bombed 22 times. One of the things the pilots used as landmarks were the big Gothic cathedrals in every town. And yes, bombing wasn't super accurate, and we tried to do some, some so-called smart bombing. It wasn't as bad as everybody says it was, because Cologne was bombed 22 times. But the cathedral is never touched. The big story is the city of Dresden, which um, will be bombed in April uh, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. We get it twice. The British get it twice. We get it twice in the day. They get it twice at night. And there's big mythology to this that hundreds of thousands of people were killed and they burned alive. Kurt Vonnegut writes about it as he marches through. A lot of those numbers are grossly exaggerated. A lot of people did die. A lot of people were trapped underground in bomb shelters. And the British will drop firebombs, sort of the same thing that we are dropping on Japan at the same time. 
and it will suck the oxygen out of their bomb shelters and around 40,000 will be killed that way. But the Germans say it was 300, 400,000. The entire city burned and was killed. That is not true. A lot of people were killed, yes. But um, Dresden was a legit target. There were 127 factories. It was a major railroad hub. So if it was bombed, none of those things could be used. The guy blamed for the firebombing of Dresden is Sir Arthur Harris of the Royal Air Force. However, it wasn't his idea to drop the firebombs. It was actually Carl Spatz's, but um, he took the blame for it and never really um, shied away for it. Um, guarding Dresden was 900,000 men and about 400,000 anti-aircraft guns. To put that into perspective of how important Dresden must have been industrially, Rommel had half that many guys, a little over half, to guard all of Normandy, from the Pas de Calais over to the Atlantic Ocean. He got the entire French coast with 500,000 men. There were 900,000 in and around the city of Dresden itself. And it was during the bombing of Dresden that um, the fastest Allied plane um, of the war is the P-51 Mustang, but 525, 550 miles an hour, the internal combustion engine. Over Dresden was the only sighting of the Messerschmitt 262s, the twin jet-powered aircraft that tried to blow up the bridge. They only fought for about 20, 25 minutes because they ran out of gas. But as fast as the P-51 was, they said, looking at a 262, they traveled twice as fast as we were. They shot a bunch of B-17 Liberators and P-51s out of the sky. Guys that later flew them said it was like flying on angels' wings. They had never seen anything move so fast before. The 262 was an idea of Hitler's. A lot of guys wanted it to be a fighter, to defend against the Allied aircraft. Hitler said no. He wanted a medium-range bomber to be able to fly and bomb London. So do not mass-produce the aircraft until it can be used as a bomber. We don't need fighters, we need bombers. They're like, oh my god, bombs throw off the weight distribution, it won't work. By the time we figure that out, the war will be over. And he said, do it like I told you. So um, a lot of guys wanted it to become a multi-platform aircraft, a fighter and a bomber, but they were never able to get that figured out until the war was over. Then, uh, in patent sector, uh, a couple Luftwaffe pilots um, said, hey, uh, in exchange for getting us out of Germany to Canada or the United States, we got something you guys really want to see. And we actually stole slash had the Germans fly 12 ME-262s from out near Munich all the way over to France so we could take a look at them. And I got the picture somewhere. I couldn't find it tonight. The first Allied guy to see it was brought out, and Carl Spatz and Patton were there, and they're like, well, how's this thing work? And he's like, man, I don't know. Get a couple of those German pilot boys back. And they're like, well, until we do that, you, you figure it out. And he got up in the cockpit and was messing around, and you know, he figured out how to, how to turn it on and hit um, the gas, and he was like, whoa, it crashed. Um, luckily, it didn't blow up on them. But the next picture shows that there are chains and tanks draped over the aircraft with the Germans sitting there talking to the mechanic on how um, the whole thing worked. So it was kind of um, comedic. But anyway, we stole the 262. And that's what happens when, when you win. So here is um, a bomber. And there is a small village or a city. You can see. Um, it looks pretty tight and, and precise there, but when we drop bombs, you know, it's the old carpet bombing. In order to make sure I'm going to hit it, I'm going to start here and, and there. And the eastern part of Germany is being blown to bits. But 
to, I guess the accuracy is kind of hard to see in the top. This is the Cathedral of Cologne with its flying buttresses, and all around it is completely destroyed. So there was some accuracy as we didn't blow up the, we blew up everything else. We blew up Aachen, we blew up Monte Cassino, so we figured we'd leave a few things um, uh, intact. And there is Dresden after the, the firebombing. You can see there are people out in the street from the heat and from the explosion, and the town was destroyed. But again, the um, death counts are, are greatly um, exaggerated. It's at this time, um, end of March, early April, that things are beginning to somewhat slacken off. Once again, enormous chunks of ground, 30, 40, 50 miles a day, are, are being covered. And then in the small, tiny little town of Ordorf, Easy Company, the 506th Airborne, are walking through the woods, staying in, in a town at night, when a couple of the veterans out on patrol come across what was the very first concentration camp found in the western sector. It wasn't very big, but it was shocking. And when Major Winters, Dick Winters, calls back to headquarters, Maxwell Taylor's like, what is it? He's like, I don't know, sir. You're going to have to see for yourself. And as he began to explain, Maxwell Taylor will call back to Pat and say, look, Winters thinks that they found something. He can't describe it. We have to go and see it. Patton will show up. He will be there with Bradley waiting Eisenhower. When Patton saw it, he threw up. He got so angry, he drove back to the town and got the mayor, the burgomeister, and his wife, and with, one, with his 45, marched them through the camp. When he told them what his plans were for the village, the Burgermeister and his wife went back home and they hanged themselves. The next day, Patton makes the whole town come out and clean up the camp. Um, a little bit later, a couple of about you know, a week later, Buchenwald, one of the largest concentration camps, was liberated. This one was completely ghastly. As Ilsa Cook, the commandant's wife, had made lampshades out of the tattooed skins of the inmates. Just a psychopathic woman. April 12th, the next day, Nordhausen goes. And underneath Nordhausen were um, Jewish workers shoved down in the basement where they were made to work on V-2 rockets. But they didn't, have, they didn't have any plumbing. They had no sanitation. All were sick. All had dysentery, diarrhea, and they had to just go on themselves. There was no stopping of the work as it was a V-2 rocket facility. 150 people there a day were being killed as the saying was no one is allowed to leave as the top secretness of the V-2 must be kept. So if you slackened in your pace or you look sick and weakly, you were one of the ones selected for um, execution. Bergen Belsen will fall on April 15th. It is famous uh, as being the concentration camp where Anne Frank was. She dies <coughs> just a week before the camp is liberated. Many of these camps were in the middle of nowhere, so nobody knew who or what they were. But on the 29th, Dachau is overrun. And Dachau is not too far outside of Munich in Bavaria, kind of the populated west side of, of Germany. And if you've ever been there, there's Dachau, and across the street is like a neighborhood. The camp was built for 2,000 people. At its height, it held over 200,000. And when people get there, the Germans can't say, well, we didn't know. Um, because you had to. It's right in the middle of your stinking town in the capital of, uh, of Bavaria. And when the soldiers saw that, they said it only renewed their anger and their vigor to get the war over. So we've just had en enough. And so here is Patton 